Welcome everybody. Ooh. We are so happy to be hosting the fourth annual um, Inclusive Education Showcase. It is a particular passion of mine that education be inclusive. And as the academic lead education of the Disability Innovation Institute, that has been my, my main aim all the way through, starting with universal design for learning and really looking at how that expands through so many different areas. So welcome and we'll get started. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Bedigal land this morning, and I would like to acknowledge the elders past, present, and emerging, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us today. Our first speakers this morning are learning and teaching with system impacted people, developing a toolkit uh, for university programs. I'm really excited about this because it's just something um, very different for me coming from just education, but I have a particular interest in criminology and juvenile justice from my past life as a high school teacher. So I would like to welcome Andy Kalodifus. Kaladophis, I am so sorry, Andy, I practiced and it went out of my head. Philip Wads, Tina McVeigh, Lucas Carey, and Kev Dertadian. Not sure who's going first. I think you need to use this. No worries. Oh, that is Thank you, everybody. Um, and yeah, really thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak here today. Um, my name is Philip Wads. I'm a senior lecturer in criminology in the Faculty of Law and Justice, start the timer, uh, and co-lead uh, of the, the project team uh, behind the work that we're going to be speaking about today. I am firmly on script for time. So our presentation today is uh, titled uh, Learning and Teaching with System Impacted People, Developing a Toolkit uh, for University Programs. Uh, and really, we're going to be speaking to an ongoing stream of work um, that commenced back in 2018 uh, when we introduced into our criminology program the first course co-developed and delivered uh, by a person with lived experience of prison. Since this time, we have commenced a number of continuing projects to establish, embed, um, and elevate a set of values uh, that uh, outline and hold us to account to deliver uh, a critical, inclusive, accessible, participatory and transformative curriculum uh, featuring voices of the most impacted by the criminal legal system. An important milestone in this project was the formation uh, earlier this year uh, of a lived experience advisory panel. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have two expert members of that panel um, and, and staff uh, in our criminology team here with us today in Tina McPhee and Lucas Carey. Uh, also presenting today uh, are Kev Dertadian and Andy Kaladolfos, two very dear friends and colleagues from the crim team. Uh, we should uh, also acknowledge um, the work of our, our broader team who have been working on this project. We obviously couldn't have everybody speaking here today. We already have quite the packed uh, number. Um, and the advisory panel, uh, other advisory manal, uh, panel members who have been contributing their time and labour to this ongoing project. We should also thank uh, and acknowledge our, our funding uh, partners in the Faculty of Law and Justice EDI Committee, the Learning and Teaching Grant Scheme, and the Centre for Criminology, Law and Justice. Uh, before we move on today, uh, we would also like to start uh, by acknowledging the sovereign Bejigal people on whose lands the UNSW Kensington campus is built as well as the Darabal, Gadigal, Wongal and Wajak Noongar people on whose lands the team uh, presenting here today live and work. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect and acknowledgement to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, uh, or Torres Strait Islander people joining us either in person or, or online today. 
as a group of uninvited settlers who have benefited immensely from access to these lands, we acknowledge that the British invaders offering this access had no authority to do so, uh, and that this illegitimate power centre remains. As such, this acknowledgement is a critical moment to orient our discussions on the legal fact that sovereignty and law were never ceded, but rather imposed in ways that continue to reap disproportionate harms on First Nations people across this country, harms which, as we will speak about in the presentation today, are fundamentally tethered to the practice and outcomes of criminology. At the 2021 John Barry Memorial Lecture hosted by the University of Melbourne's criminology team, serious questions were asked about our discipline uh, and its role in sustaining systems of harm and oppression. Torres Strait Islander woman and Deputy Dean Indigenous at Melbourne University, Sana Nakata, in her very moving acknowledgement at this event, uh, called on those in the audience to use the discomfort of acknowledgements as an opportunity to reflect on how we might commit to, the, uh, to and act in solidarity with First Nations people in this country, to commit to the making of a different kind of a future to meet the generosity of an acknowledgement with generosity. She said the reward for doing so would not be hope, but purpose. And only then we might find ourselves not only welcome to country, but welcome to the fight, the fight so very needed to realize justice in this place. So far from being a passive gesture to commence our session today, this acknowledgement presentation and the work that animates it are part of the purpose and commitment that we as a group share to improve the accessibility, inclusivity and safety of our criminology program here at UNSW. We are going to start the presentation today uh, with Kev, who's going to speak about universal design for learning, uh, which really does underpin um, the work that we have long done in our program. We'll then hear from Tina um, about the experiences of staff and students who are system impacted, We'll then hear from Lucas, who's going to speak about our lived experience advisory panel and the work it has done to date. Uh, and Kev will finish uh, with a, dis uh, sorry, and Andy will finish uh, with a discussion of uh, a student experience pilot project that is just commencing. I'll then do a very hopefully quick job uh, of, of bringing this all together and, and, and speaking about what we can take from this in relation to the broader inclusion project in higher education. Thanks, Phil, for orienting us in place and purpose so powerfully with that acknowledgement. It's really fantastic. By way of context, I'd like to provide a definition for the term system impacted, which appears in the title of our presentation and which is uh, developed and championed by um, uh, lived experience scholars as part of the Birkbeck Underground Scholars Network. So lived experience, sorry, um, system impacted refers to people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, uh, including people who have been criminalized by police, people who have lived in prison, and people who have lived in out of home care. But it also includes um, uh, people whose family members have uh, and uh, people who have close friends who have been impacted by the legal system because they, of course, uh, are also navigating those systems. Okay, so um, uh, in conducting uh, these projects that Phil has just introduced and via the definition of system impacted that we have just um, explained, I'd like to give uh, a short introduction to uh, universal design for learning, uh, because this is what has guided us through a values-led pedagogy through the program. Uh, most of you will be well aware of this, but I just wanted to give a brief introduction. So um, in the education space where this work has played out, we have taken a universal design for learning approach. What does that mean? Uh, it means uh, that um, we, uh, sorry, the universal design for learning approach was developed in schools, uh, originally used to address the diverse learning needs uh, of uh, students in the classroom, as well as to take up a call to use technology in classrooms in inclusive ways. So this approach is not the same as kind of uh, specific classes for students with uh, differentiated learning needs or differentiated instructions uh, and activities within the same classroom. Uh, while those are valuable ways of doing inclusive education, universal design uh, seeks to not only include students uh, or uh, include students with diverse needs in learning, 
but to draw from the strengths uh, of diverse students in uh, student abilities in the same classroom by explicitly designing to the margins, right? Designing the classes to the margin is the term sometimes used. So its application in tertiary education has largely been in response to significant increases in the enrollment of students living with disability at university. And its primary kind of point of difference in this space is that it allows students or seeks to allow students to access course materials, uh, removing the need for uh, these students to actively seek support and to disclose their learning needs. Um, to educators. So a kind of key principle then is the in the implementation of universal design uh, in universities to recognize that while there is no average learner and that learners come with a wide range, uh, uh, with a wide variety of prior experiences, abilities, preferences, and needs, our institutions uh, and systems of learning, like universities, um, often have an ideal learner in mind and that um, often their systems are geared towards those kinds of learners. So how does this translate then to working with students and colleagues who are system impacted? Well, it means we seek to design all of our classes uh, to facilitate the inclusion of system impacted people uh, and in ways that uh, limit the stigmatization of this group amongst the rest of the student cohort. I'm now going to uh, hand it over to Tina to uh, provide a, a sense of why this is so important. Thank you, Kev. Um, so Lucas, who will be talking after me, um, him and I bring to this work every ounce of our lived experience. And today's conversation will be unashamedly subjective. And personally, I think this makes it authentic and relational. In fact, I believe our subjectivity has been and always will be our strength. Our intimate experience in this area is our expertise. It's what makes our presence in this space legitimate and hopefully worth hearing. Let me tell you a story. I'll never forget my first day of university. I was thrilled to be offered a place in the Bachelor of Criminology as a first generation student and was confident that the discipline would be a safe space for me. It was my first day outside of the prison walls in four and a half years. And as I sat in the front row of the lecture hall in Tandanya, Adelaide, with my prison issued pen and paper, I listened to a respected criminologist refer to people like me as offenders and criminals. It was a brutal introduction to the world of criminology and a shining example of what is called epistemic violence. These labels are not neutral. They are part of the dehumanizing project of the prison and the ease with which they are spoken in places of education demonstrates how far the tentacles of the carceral system can reach. Derogatory system language has been developed, represented and legitimized in non-carceral settings where it continues the prison effect stifling policy reform, entrenching bias, and leaving folks like myself and Lucas feeling disparaged and increasingly fed up. So why does it matter what words we use to describe people like Lucas and I who have lived in prison or been convicted of an offence? It's because dehumanisation starts with language, and when we are dehumanised, it makes it harder for us to successfully live and thrive. So let's make a simple change and try to make things a bit better. We are not offenders, we are people. We are formerly incarcerated people. We are people who have lived in prison or people with conviction histories. Now, some of my comrades liken the tricky space that formerly incarcerated students and staff occupy to a liminal identity, which is a state of being in between two identities, often requiring a significant amount of bridge work across being authentic and relatable enough to present fellow carceral citizens yet reformed and deserving enough to be occupying a university space. Similar bridge work applies to people who have intersected with the criminal legal system in other ways. For instance, having the experience of being harmed or identifying as a victim survivor. However, for those of us who also carry the burden of being responsible for that harm, we face a collective scorn and legal discrimination that is uncompromising. This is especially true for formerly incarcerated women, particularly Indigenous women, gender diverse folks and trans people. We don't get to play the lovable, lovable larrikin who stumbled unwittingly or a little mischievously into crime or the reformed gang member with the epic tale of overcoming the odds. We must be the perfect, polite and unthreatening picture of rehabilitation. Softly spoken, articulate but not too intelligent, inferior, guilt-ridden, apologetic, corrected. Then and only then can we be heard. 
And up until now, finding safety on Australian campuses with allies, but most importantly, other students or scholars with lived experience is purely by chance. There's no underground scholars like there is in Californian universities, no formed and functioning body of identifying folks who can provide the solidarity and aid in navigating an often brutal reentry experience. Instead, we stumble across each other because a trailblazer before us has had the courage to self-identify in an institution that has not necessarily been welcoming of folks like us. So now I hand over to Lucas, who will tell you about the trailblazing work we are doing with the criminology team as part of the Lived Experience Advisory Panel. Thank you, Tina. I appreciate it immensely. And, uh, and the, the power of the story continues. And as Tina mentioned, is I also identified as a justice impacted person and I've been lucky enough to be involved um, in the University of New South Wales for several years now, uh, working in the criminology department. And as Tina mentioned, it's been a case of knocking the door down and it's been a case of making sure that we are heard and are seen and are actually welcome at the table. And what was identified and developed through those needs was the Lived Experience Advisory Panel. This Lived Experience Advisory Panel was established in 2022, and it comprises of members of the academic team and also previous and current students who have been previously incarcerated or justice impacted. What this does is this brings together a really balanced approach. It brings together an approach of the lived, living and learnt experience. And it brings these areas together and provides something that is not being done in other places inside Australia. As Tina mentioned previously, is there are some great uh, international learnings through places like in, in, in Berkeley University, also in other, other areas throughout the US that take place in this space, also through the UK. But we identified that it, this instance of lived experience needed uh, action on three key levels. After undertaking regular meetings with panel and criminology team members, we met at a whole staff approach. And we do this online, understanding that the expertise that we seek in this space is not limited just to one area. This is not limited to just sitting on Badagal, on Badagal land in Sydney. This is a situation where expertise exists in this area across the country and across the world. And us being best practice in this area, reach out to that. I sit here in Western Australia as we speak to you now in Perth as an active member of the UNSW criminology team. We identified three levels where action needs to take place and where, 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 where we need to be involved. And that's at course level, program level, and also institutional level. So from the course level, and again, Tina is really steering a lot of this stuff through her amazing work. Uh, and her amazing intersections with overseas areas is the transformative practices in the classroom. And the great intersection between learnt experienced practitioners, lived experienced practitioners working in the same classroom is providing a great opportunity for people in the areas of pedagogy, curriculum, pedagogy, curriculum and university administration to understand that this link is important. And the safety of the students and staff is important in the same breath. We also identified that program and facility level was essential. So we've looked through grounded curriculum. So making sure that we adapted our core principles that, that, that were, were linked and presented by Kaneen and Tori in 2016, where we look at making sure that we're ensuring reciprocity. So we're speaking truth to power. We're making sure that there is, as Tina mentioned in her own um, first experience in the classroom, we're understanding that this becomes a safe place for not only staff, but also students in this area. We ensure that we have real, meaningful and ongoing engagement with the affected communities. We don't pass them and say, hey, welcome, you're just here because you're different or you're just here because you bring something with you. No, you're valued. There's no, in our advisory panel and in the classroom settings that we're trying to develop, there is no us and them. It is all us. It is we together doing this. We gain access to ongoing funding and support for program development and staff development work. So people know what they're doing. People are able to see what is happening internationally, what is happening best practice, so we can steer this. We talk about language. We look at some of the work that has been done across, that is being done across other universities in the space of criminology under subjects such as working with offenders or dealing with criminals are the titles of some of the subjects that are taught at other universities. This language doesn't take place here because it's discussed in 
extensive areas through our lived experience advisory panel. We then look at the institutional level, and this is the challenging part for us. So we are nationally behind the significant work of the UK and the US. However, Australia-wide, we are leading the pack. We are renowned and known for this. Last week, presentation over here in in Western Australia regarding family and domestic violence and assisting with reintegration in those areas and work from the UNSW lived experience panel and certainly Andy was presented as part of this key area. So this work is being recognised nationally. We then make sure that we need to continue to work with justice impacted staff and students to ensure that we can break down the barriers for employment. So it is not a case of great, you have a criminal record, you can't be involved in academia, which is what happens at a lot of other universities throughout the country and throughout the world. We are working to make sure that happens. We're also working to make sure that we provide advice and distinct information forward that can make the transition from student to staff member also smoother. We're also looking at making sure that we're incorporating the use of IT to assist in that happening. I will pass over, as we all are with Time Challenged, I'll pass it over to Andy to uh, to continue on with the presentation. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much uh, to my colleagues um, for their you know wonderful introductions, especially to Tina and Lucas for sharing their experiences as both students and as staff um, now working in criminology. Um, so I'm talking about the, um, the kind of current tranche of our work, which is um, the student experience pilot project. In terms of university EDI and equ equitable learning services, they've long recognised the distinct learning support needs importantly providing structured support and resourcing for First Nations students, students with disabilities and those experiencing financial hardship. But despite the known harms of criminalisation and state carceral practices bearing heavily on these same groups, students with lived experience of the criminal legal system are an almost entirely unconsidered student cohort for EDI and equi equitable learning um, services, but they are those that have distinct learning and institutional support needs. As such, we sought funding from our faculty's EDI inclusion committee to conduct a pilot study on the experiences of lived uh, of um, system impacted students in our faculty. This project was the first recommendation of our lived experience advisory panel, as it became quickly apparent that we needed more information. Sorry, everyone, apparently my camera was off. <laughs> As it became quickly apparent um, that we needed more information on the experiences and challenges of system impacted students. From the panel's first hand experience of university, and we've heard a little bit about that today, to our various conversations um, with system impacted students, we know that they have support needs beyond what's currently considered in the bounds of special consideration. And that extends to curriculum development in teaching and learning about system impacted people, ensuring safety and supporting students within the classroom, and also specific challenges around the necessary disclosures for equity considerations. International research has considered the experience of victim survivors in classrooms where discussions are being had about sexual and gender-based violence um, and have created safety recommendations based on UDL and survivor-led principles. There's been a strong focus on inclusivity initiatives in this space, predominantly advice about creating a safe space in the classroom, enhancing soft skills, um, as well as a strong teacher presence in student-led discussions, sorry, in survivor-led discussions. Generally, this refers to um, a kind of inclusive environment that can facilitate student learning in non-judgmental settings. Others have pushed these perspectives a bit further to uh, more transformative practices, such as survivor-focused class designs, um, co-design class principles with victim survivors, institutional support, such as counselling services, particular special consideration needs and gendered violence reporting portals. Overall, the slower take up of those transformative practices over perhaps the easier inclusive um, frameworks means that our tools can often be ineffective and sometimes harm producing. And we heard from Tina uh, uh, you know, that we can, who, who you know, reminds us really powerfully that we can and are um, 
harm producers in the words and concepts that we teach if we don't consider transformative and anti-oppression practices in our classrooms. By contrast to the research on victim survivors, very little research has been conducted on the broader system impacted student experiences, challenges and support needs studying at university at all, and certainly not within programs such as criminology, law, psychology and social work, where classroom discussions of criminalisation and incarceration occur regularly. And in, the, in these disciplines, they are often taught by leading experts without lived experience who use dehumanising and stigmatising language and concepts. And just you know, for the benefit of the audience that isn't in criminology in these disciplines, just can't emphasise how um, ubiquitous this language is across, across criminology and, and allied spaces. So in any of our classrooms, at any time, we may have people that have been incarcerated or criminalised or crucially, whose family and friends have also been system impacted. When we talk about these people as our topics in curriculum and use language that Tina has highlighted, this is not an abstract thing for, st for students or for staff. It's them, it's their family, it's their communities, it's their lives. And so this is the reason why we devised the pilot study, which is currently underway. We've actually just launched it. Um, we're just launching it next week um, to interview current and former students in criminology and law courses at UNSW to better understand their experiences in the classroom and their support needs at that program, faculty and university level. And you'll see throughout this presentation, we think it's really critical that we recognise that our approaches to this must be a whole system approach. Changes in a single classroom or a program aren't enough. To enact meaningful change, we need to create systems that will ensure longevity of inclusive practice um, and, and support initiatives and longevity you know, beyond you know, uh, uh, just, just the group you know, here that you're, that, you, that you're hearing from today being involved. Um, so we designed the study so that system impacted students can be interviewed by a staff member with lived experience of criminalisation and incarceration. This factor builds on learning principles in social science teaching, such as those called um, credible messengers, peer-to-peer -peer teaching and participatory teaching, learning and mentoring models. And this is to ensure that system impacted students feel safe and heard to disclose their experiences during interviews and during focus groups. And we believe that's really crucial to the viability of that pilot. We expect that findings might range from wellbeing and safety issues in the classroom, the use of equitable learning services and peer to peer support needs. We're conscious that the recommendations may call for a transformation to institutional processes. For example, we know that we need to provide better advice to students when applying for special consideration about personal disclosures and what happens to the data that they provide. Too many students disclose deeply traumatic experiences in detail because they fear a no from special consideration. It's important that we get this right, not only for privacy and security reasons, but also because carceral practices seen here enacted through punishment systems such as late penalties, and I know that we're hearing a bit more about that from Deb later, promote stigma and fear of judgment that ultimately hurt all of us. They hinder access to education and maybe especially re-traumatising for system impacted students. And now passing back to Phil to conclude our presentation. I'll keep this brief because uh, I know we're at or over time. Uh, so thank you for sticking with us and, and thank you, Andy. Um, I think, you know, today's presentation is, is, is a starting point, hopefully for engaging um, beyond our program and more with the institution um, on, on this topic. I think our collective works and the projects that we've undertaken uh, for a number of years now um, have consistently demonstrated that while often overlapping uh, in experience and identity with groups more traditionally supported uh, by the university that there is, has been um, a little to no consideration of the needs of system impacted people and those with lived or living experience of prison. Our collective endeavours have been committed to looking at the ways um, that we as a program uh, can do this, but obviously we know um, that to sustain this and to deliver, deliver the, the benefits and uh, improvements that are clearly need, needed um, to, uh, to engage with the broader project of inclusion in higher education, um, that we collectively as an institution need to be doing far more than we currently are. 
I'll leave it there. That was great. So interesting. I um, will do questions for everybody at the end, if that's okay. Um, I want to apologize. I had a rare but very real anxiety attack when I stood up here at the beginning and I muffed the introduction of you lovely people and the acknowledgement and didn't introduce myself at all. <laughs> Forgot who I was. Um, I'm Professor Terry Cumming and I'm a professor of special education at the School of Education and also the academic lead education of the Disability Innovation Institute. Um, Actually, Deb is right after you guys, so it was such a nice segue from listening to the things that our system-impacted students need to you actually offering somewhat one of the solutions. So I give you Deborah Barros Leal Farias. Let me go here. Well, thank you, Terry, and hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is, I, I tell students that they can call me Dr. D. It's just the simplest one because Barros Lau Farias rolls off the tongue easily only if you're from Brazil or Portugal. So I'll forgive everyone. Um, so yes, it is a great segue because essentially this is about talking about um, something that I've been doing since 2021. So I started it during the, the pandemic and I've been doing it since. And really it's this idea about catering to students. So also to introduce myself, I, I teach um, politics and international relations at the School of Social Sciences. And I'm also the uh, co-champion for well-being. So well-being for me, just also to get a sense, I, I, I kind of like to explain it as a way that it's something that matters to everyone. It's not only about mental health, but it's also about just everyone who luckily doesn't have a mental health issue, but it doesn't mean that you're still aren't struggling in some way or another. So it's sort of below that threshold that you actually need to go to a doctor or a therapist, but it's still there and it's still impacting a lot of things in what you do. Um, so I've been doing this since 2021 and Chris Maloney, he is, um, he's a, he's a lecturer at the School of Medicine and he is the current director for the community of practice on student well-being. So we've been talking about this since last year and this year what we did is we decided to write a piece together on this experience so i had the material most of the stuff that i'm going to present today it's well it's a mix between the the data that we gathered this term and stuff that i had from before um just to say this was the we thought about different names this was a name that we thought of sometimes can't hand it in times happens because it has the best acronym. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we'll still stick to that because that's very memorable. But anyway, so this is essentially a summary of what I have been doing, which is the idea of giving students an opportunity for a small flexibility on some assignments. Um, more specifically, a flexibility on the assignment due date. This is not for every single assignment. In the case, in all my courses, I have three assignments, um, two that are around you know, week four, the other one maybe around week eight, week nine. And I've always made the last one, which is either a final exam or a final essay, not available for this. One of the reasons that I've explained to students why it, you know, I became kind of fascinated. I began to read about material on, you know, how does this affect, like on the pedagogy side of how, you know, flexibility affects students. And um, one of the things that was said is that first, if you give just total flexibility, it tends to have a negative effect. Like if you say all your assignments will only be due at the very end of the very last day, it actually makes a lot of students just go and do everything at the very last week. So that's not really the ideal. Um, and what I wanted to, to also highlight is that there's a tendency for a lot of people in a lot of colleagues to say, well, the firm deadlines, because that's how the world is. 
And when you think of it, that's not really how the world is. I mean, the world is like that sometimes, you know, an ARC grant or, you know, there's some things that do have firm deadlines. It's kind of what I say when it comes to the final exam. It's like, you know, after midnight, the, 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 the link disappears. You can't, you can't do, but that's not most things in life. A lot of things in life in the workplace, if something happens that is unexpected usually you can go to your supervisor your boss a colleague a journal editor and say can i just have a couple more days can i just you know just a limited sort of flexibility that is normal in a lot of times in the workplace but at the same time it's not something that you can do for every single time you have something due right so for me i kept thinking for students and you'll see how this was designed um also, one of the things, so there's a lot of little elements to this, which I'll be more than happy to share afterwards if anybody has questions, is that I was trying to capture here things that aren't covered by uh, equitable learning plans or special considerations. I understand that the university, for the sake of equity, has to have a couple of rules on, you know, how these things are granted. But I kept thinking, well, there's a lot of things that fall under this thing, or for some students, it's just not worth the effort of gathering all the material, applying, you know, all the, the, the stuff. So st students sometimes, what they'll do is they'll email the convener, they'll have to explain their whole story, you know, can I have, and sometimes just to have like an extra, can I just have another 48 hours or 28 hours? My, you know, my computer broke down. I had a fight with my boyfriend. Um, I'll, I'll tell some of the stories that students have here that are things that, or even to say, you know, my, my best friend is visiting. Can I, you know, I'm trying to juggle time and students want to deliver good stuff. So that's why the way that I did it, it's it's a, the idea of a 48 hour possible extension. And I don't really want to even call it an extension, because basically, we know also that some of the deadlines that we choose are a little bit arbitrary, like it can be, you know, on the Tuesday of week five, but I could have done it on Friday of week five, like I just chose because I don't know, I have to choose a date. Um, and so this is about having this sort of allowing students to say, okay, the deadline is 17, but if you want, you can push this deadline for the 19. And then it's as if all the other things after the 19th, everything is going, everything in terms of uh, special considerations, equitable learning plan. So there was no disturbance to that. And it's available like for all students. Um, so why? Because in the real world, small flexibilities over deadlines are given. Not all the time, but occasionally and quite frequently sometimes. But also thinking about students, these are some of the things, right? To reduce student stress over deadlines. This is one of the most pressing things that students feel. Um, I mean, even if our term was 16 weeks, which is how my was in Brazil. So people's like, oh my God, I want more weeks. And like, oh, be careful with what you wish for. You don't want 16 weeks of, of being a student or teaching. Um, but anyway, it is something that does concern students quite a lot. Um, and with the shortened deadline, this is overlapped with a lot of teachers because that's how the term is. You're not really putting a whole lot of stuff on week one or week two. There's, there's kind of paths when we have to do this times. This also has been an added bonus because a lot of the stuff that we receive from students tends to be in this 40 hour time frame. Um, and then you have to go in the back and forth and you're like, am I being fair? Do I say no to everyone? Do I say yes to everyone? Do I say yes to only some of the cases? But then you have to tell me more about your case. And then it also puts this bias on students who really don't want to share what they're going through. They won't. And they're the ones sometimes who need that, you know, smidge of time there. And what I tried to do was to try to incent like incentivize students to reflect on their need for an extra time. Like, why do you need this? Do you need this because you were disorganized? And if you are disorganized, is that something because, hey, maybe you might have ADHD. Maybe you have never been taught how to plan and you tend to do things at the deadline because you just don't know better. Um, maybe you're procrastinating because you have an anxiety that hasn't been treated and you actually need to do something about it. Or maybe not, maybe it's just, you know, life happens. Um, so here's the point that I try to make is that to ask students, you know, 
if this is a you know this this extra time a one time event or a reflection of a bigger problem but also saying you know if you think this could be a reflection of something bigger that if you needed this for every single class you're taking this term for every single assignment um, I would also remind students, this is how, this is the person you should contact, talk to a student advisor, or maybe go and seek counseling here at UNSW to see, you know, and, and kind of suggest or come and talk to me and, and, you know, maybe I can help you with someone who can help you with whatever you're going through. Um, so I used to call it 48 hour waiver. Now I'm calling it flex deadline because I think it's relatively easier. So basically, out of the three assignments, I gave students of two assignments. One, they couldn't, but they could choose either one or the other. They could use it once. So it was a one-time opportunity to submit one assignment up to 48 hours afterwards uh, with no penalties whatsoever. Also, why 48 hours? My logic was um, special considerations. I think one of the things is that it has to be something that has affected your studies for three or more days. So whoever is caught in the I ate bad sushi, I'm not going to go to the GP to say, you know, I spent one day in the bathroom, whatever. Like, it's just not worth the effort. But this is kind of the idea of covering it. Could not be used in the final exam. And more importantly, no need to justify why they were using it. It was in the sense that if you want to talk about something more serious, please come talk to me. But you don't have to explain. And basically, they had to fill out a form. Um, and then all penalties were normal. This is literally the screen grab of the form that I asked. I only asked two things. For one of the courses that I did this term was I had, um, where's the, the thing? Well, where's the little, maybe here? Yeah, here. So they had to do two videos. And so the only thing they had to do is just click just before they were going to submit. They just needed to click this and then give me their name and there's that ID. That was all. The reason that I did this is because doing this, it generates, this is just Microsoft form that we have, it generates um, a spreadsheet. And so what I did, which was the only extra work that I needed to have was once all of the assignments had been handed in, just as you do and say, okay, who has an LP? Who has special considerations? I would also go with those others and say, who also requested, you know, for this thing? That was it. That took me maybe, you know, maybe an extra 10 minutes of work. Definitely less work than all of the emails and all of the stress that would have come with, you know, my internet router broke down and this is what I have to do. So that was it. And it also made it easier for me to go and check if there was someone trying to double dip, because then there would be one for, you know, the, the assignment one and assignment two. So that was easy. And um, this for this year, this is one of the cases. So this year I was teaching two courses. So this one, I had 60 students. I had three assessments, so they could use it for the first two. Um, Sorry, that was that should be 2021. And this this was just fascinating what happened because in the first case, so with 60 students, because one of the questions that I got was, well, what if everybody wants to use it? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's see what happens. That was definitely not the case. This one that I did in 2021, it was 20 students, then only 12, which means that basically half of the class never used it. And as you will see, so this is one of the, the key outcomes from this exercise, is that there was something that I didn't imagine that was going to be a benefit, but there was. The students who didn't use it, who didn't use it, they reported that it also decreased their stress because they knew that if they needed, that option was there. So for me, I just thought it was fascinating with this idea of you know, you're not even using it, but just the fact that you're offering already decreases everyone's collective stress and trying to manage and say, okay, how can I make this work? Um, so these were the results for the one that I did in 2021. Now, the one that I did this year with the same class, with the same structure, was different in the results because it was the first time I tried video, which actually is a good segue to the people who will come after me to talk about AI, because one of the reasons is that the case studies that I had, once chat GPT came along, I'm like, 
I can't do what I was doing because chat GPT would simply go and just, you know, it would give a pretty decent answer. It would be like in the, you know, high 60s range or low 70s. Um, and so I decided to ask students to actually create videos. And a lot of the students that, as you'll see, the numbers were way up in using it because students, most students, especially I think that do political science don't do any sort of video. So a lot of students were at the end, you know, I told them like, this, I'm not judging your, you know, performance. You know, this is not that kind of thing. Like I want content, but still a lot of people were like, oh, I'm not sure how to do this or I do this. And it was supposed to be eight minutes and now mine is 12 and I have to cut. So as you can see, the numbers are really, really like different. Um, but it has to do with this very novel thing. So I see this one as kind of a one-off. Now with my other class, which is a master's course, it was, as you can see, even more impressive that 60% of the class did not use it. Even though it was there, they could have used 60%. They said, you know what? I actually don't need this. So this for me is really some of the interesting things of saying, um, there is a lot of this, you know, this benefit that is there. Um, and so this is some of the feedback. So this is the feedback. So for this year, and this is the part that I'm working with Chris, is that we designed, um, you know, we went with an ethics application, we designed questions, and we asked students so we could formally write a paper on this. Out of the 155 students, we got, you know, pretty decent number, 54, giving us feedback. And um, why did you use it? Well, did you use it? Overall, of the students who answered, right, 73% had used it. It still means that 25% of our answers did not. And because we did it with Qualtrics, we can kind of play around and we're, we're still going to look at the data. Um, this is probably what a lot of people are curious about. Students could choose multiple answers. If you use this opportunity for flexibility, what was the reason? As you can see, the highest one was unexpected life or work event, which exactly this, life happens. Um, a mental health issue, also with a high number. Poor time management, which is kind of the go-to that most people think, only nine people out of the 54 actually said it was poor time management. So it was really, I think there tends to be an emphasis on students are not handing something in. It's because they're lazy. They're not properly planning. They're doing the wrong thing. It's their fault. When actually you have a big chunk here, a health issue, um, others, and then a tech issue. So there's, there's a variety, and even tech issue, I think it was higher because of the, the new system that I had implemented, students being you know, a little hesitant. And I'll just go with some of the feedback that I got from 2021, because I want to keep the feedback from now, like I want to keep the juicy bits for our paper. <laughs> anyway, so for example, this student saying, I got a bad cold when it came time to record the video. So the new deadline let me record the assignment when I was feeling better. Actually, this is uh, feedback from now. Uh, my husband twisted his wrist a day before the deadline, and I had to accompany him to the hospital, which took me almost the whole day. Flexible policy helped me to accompany him without worrying about the assessment. So yes, this is a case where someone probably could have gone maybe to special considerations, but then getting the documents from the husband, from the hospital, but it was only one day, but it was still a nuisance. Others, for example, talking about uh, the quality of the assessment. I usually seek to write better assessments myself, and I often write two versions of the assessment because I always feel like my writing isn't good enough. I just felt psychologically, it just felt psychologically good to have an extra day or two to improve the overall quality of the work. So it was interesting how some people use it in this regard. And the others were just the other things about life. It is always it is always way less stressful, which is probably only psychologic, to be able to have a new deadline and allow more agency to how organized study, work, social life, and the other planned extension to help balance work, life, family commitment. So it's about giving students a level of flexibility that it's not disturbing for a convener, like this is not messing up, you know, your whole term, but students are benefiting from it. Um, whether you used it or not, how did you feel? very happy to say nobody had an increase and nobody who answered said no change, that everybody said that it had a moderate decrease on their stress and anxiety or, you know, over half of those who answered had a significant decrease. So this was very good. 
Would you like more or all courses to have a flexible deadline option? 95% <laughs> yes. And I will say that UNSW, that's what I've heard, that next term, right, there will be beginning of a, a process with seven days. And even though that has been, you know, or will be introduced, it's still up to the conveners to pick, you know, how many days or how that will work. And I think this is a reflection of saying, even if you don't do a whole week, but do a couple of days of, of an option, although the point is to make it clear, very clear to the students, you have a deadline. The days that you give after are a grace period. And like you don't want to use those because you don't know what's going to happen. And it might just be that you extend thinking, no, I actually, the deadline is not on the 17th, it's on the 20th. And then life happens in that process. And then you're going to be, so it's, I, I think that's the part that really needs to be flagged. Um, to, to saying no, there was one student that said that he thought it got in the way because he kind of thought of, or they, I don't know if it's it's um, he or she, but this student, they said that um, they had sort of thought with the extra two days, they left it to do in the two days and then things happened. And so they said, oh, if there hadn't been that, I'd probably done it before, but that's just to keep now. Um, what would you have done? Um, this is quite interesting with a lot of students. This is the feedback that they want to, they want to give in good stuff, you know? So it's like, um, what would you have done? It would have been at a lower quality far, you know, far lower quality. It wouldn't have been much poorer quality, worse work. I'd sacrifice my well being. It would have been far worse quality with great stress, no sleepovers and a few breakdowns, terrible quality, far less work. So it, it does make a difference for some students that they're like, I want to do this right. Um, and others saying, you know, it was quite comforting. It allowed me to replan my poor mental health, um, all of that. This obviously is one of the best parts. So if you didn't use it, what were the effects? Step back and check in, felt assured, comforting, huge stress relief, would have made me significant less stress if they had this in other courses, um, make students enjoy uni experience more. Um, so that was really good. And see, this is this is the kind of stuff. My partner, five years and I split a week before SA2 was due. And, and this for anyone, this would get you if you were in a workplace and you said to, you know, your supervisor, look, I just broke up, a, you know, I'm getting separated from my husband or my partner of five years. I'm really not in a good headspace right now. But then students have to be disclosing this to every single teacher which, who's more likely to say that's a you problem, not me, um, which is not helpful. So all the stuff here about... Um, Although UNSW would like to think they should be prioritized, but they are a temporary obstacle needed to be recognized in a relevant career. Um, thinking that, you know, all teachers thinking my course is the number one thing in your life. And no, some people need to work. Like some people need, you know, they have kids, they have other things that are really, really time consuming or that really affect their own personal life. Anyway, um, there's a really here, this thing, our experiences are not serious enough for ELP or special considerations. And yeah, basically that's, yeah, I'm glad that this is the last one because basically I could go on for, I said, I think I'm going to be at 15 minutes, which is obviously not because I get excited about this, but hopefully, yeah, if you have any questions afterwards on the, on the minutia or other things, I'd be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. I kind of wish the university gave our, us academics a two. <laughs> A 48 hour space for a lot of our deadlines, like maybe turning your grades in. <laughs> um, next, we have James Bedford and William Skates Francis that are going to talk to us about reimagining higher education in the age of generative AI. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so we are from across the road academic skills um we're academic uh, learning facilitators or alps as we like to call which always makes me think of that 80s tv show um we're here to talk about i'm kind of almost regretting the title because it sounds like we've got some massive like lofty ideas about reshaping the way the university works and operates um we we're kind of trying to draw it back a little bit and talk about some um redesign that we did for a course last term um, which was uh, a gen y academic skills course um, this is one of our flagship programs where it's kind of, I guess the brainchild of it was to give students 
the kind of course that I wish I had have had when I started university, which is like essay writing, presentation skills, um, all the things that's kind of like assumed knowledge, which no one ever really tells you. Um, and there's a bit of a stigma about getting help about that advice. So um, that was kind of the crux of that course. Um, and in the wake of AI, November 2022, ChatGPT being released, um, Will and I had a sort of opportunity to kind of rethink how that course would operate um, and what that might look like in terms of the assessments that we designed. Um, part of our job as well is seeing students and having consults and, and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so we have a really, as a unit, interesting insight into the, the university as a whole in terms of what's being done in other courses um, and how students at various levels of their learning life cycle are handling things. So from pre-university to um, high degree, we see all kinds of students. Um, and one of the things that was coming up was obviously this, this AI thing um, and what that means for the, their education. Um, so Will's gonna talk a bit about uh, the sort of the problem that we faced and, and how we tried to uh, alleviate that. So I'll hand it over to him. So I'll start with um, the, the kind of uh, conversation that we had in the very beginning of designing this course or redesigning this course. Um, and we, we sort of thought about ways to bring students in and also make um, the assessments a little bit more accessible, a little bit more varied. Um, and one thing that we were thinking about at the time was that the nature of generative AI in terms of like just the way that it sort of crowdsources responses to things. You ask it a question and then the answers, and we've already had kind of a conversation about this, um, the way that it generates answers is in a very kind of normative way. It creates a norm, right? It's by its very nature, it, it obscures diversity. Um, there might be diverse answers, but usually um, the the kind of nature of them is that they'll they'll will represent a kind of standard, right? Um, and just in general, I mean, we and this is something that we address through the course. Um, the way that generative AI is to, is designed is in a very like uh, oftentimes. Um, you know, in terms of uh, gender discrimination, in terms of race, like it's terrible, right? Um, and so these are kind of problems that manifest in general in society and its application in the workplace, but it was also something that really um, exists at a university level in the sense that we now have a situation where lecturers are writing their questions and marking using AI. And then the, the questions that they're, that they're kind of um, setting are then being answered by our AI in turn, at which point it's kind of like, what's the point, right? We're, and this is where we came to, which you can't really read my handwriting because it's terrible, but this is what remains. We wanted to um, kind of view this as a question that wasn't just about us, right? Like a lot of people have Kind of approach the question of AI through this very carceral lens, lens right? That ask that they present themselves as kind of people who need to police extensions and police deadlines and everything like that, right? And and we wanted to look at it in a different way. You know, how do we how do we approach AI as a shared problem as something that that imp that is you know that matters and should matter to all of us? And so we went into it with a few principles, and one was that we we thought that. A lot of the ways that students think about, and this is something that we found through the course, was that students view university sometimes through the lens of like getting a job, but oftentimes through like a, a, it being a place where they find themselves or they find, they answer these questions of ontology, like what, what, who am I? Like, what am I doing? Um, and this sometimes goes through disciplinary forms, but in general, it was just like, that was something that they emphasized, right? Um, and so we wanted to view that as the way that we do engagement. We wanted to engage them in terms of how the, do they think about them, their, themselves in the university and what is the ideal university to them? What could the university look like? What potentials does AI present for that? Um, and also what problems does it present for that? Through the course of the subject, I became more and more of a Luddite. Um, whereas James went the other way. So we, we, we have like a lot of interesting discussions about that, right? Because, um, and so we wanted to bring students into those, those conversations and the way that my thinking changed through the course was informed by students, like the, the, their responses really changed my mind about a lot of things. So we wanted to emphasize transparency. So we brought them in, we told them like, this is a redesign course. We designed this in the two weeks leading up to this. Um, and you know, uh, you're, you're part of this, like this is all kind of, we're doing it as it goes. Um, we wanted that to be a kind of mutual relationship. So we wanted to indicate to them that we really did respect like what they what they thought about the course and how we were teaching and so on. Um, and part of that was that we, we wanted to emphasize process over product in the assessment, right? We wanted to look not at what they ended up producing because that's something that can be 
produced through AI, but how they went about that. And we wanted to make that all explicit. So how do they read? How do they research? And why, and it was something that we've been kind of asking ourselves is, you know, why don't people do this in tutorials? Like we have these tutorials, why are they often just, here's a reading, let's talk about it. As opposed to like, let's read this together or let's, you know, let's work on the assignment together. I mean, they often related to it, right? So we wanted that, we wanted them to be flexible. So we wanted to allow flexibility. And so the actual format of this, James will speak to. Um, but yeah, it was, these were the kind of principles that we brought to it because we thought that um, we wanted to make it accessible and we also um, wanted to make it interesting for them as well as for us. Oh, yeah. oh I can do it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we didn't do anything that extravagant, like, to be honest. I think the, the things that we did were fairly simple. Um, one of them was to, instead of doing what was originally a, an essay um, plan, was to refocus it as a kind of an essay draft. So usually um, in the course, the students will submit an essay, what we used to call essay one. Um, what was the essay question for this term? It was impact of AI on higher education or something like that, which was so fun to mark. Um, and so originally students would have to write an essay in this course um, that was finished and polished and ready to submit. Um, so we kind of changed that idea to then be, let's just call it a draft. Let's give it a bit of flexibility in terms of the word count. Um, and let's sort of give them the opportunity to get feedback before they submit the final thing. So the draft is still marked, but we're a little more kind of lenient in terms of things like the grammar and the expression and the, the polished nature of the document. We gave, there was a bit of flexibility there. Um, and so that was something that was really useful for the students because I think it takes off a lot of the anxiety of having to submit a finished thing. Um, because I know that's not how I really work. I like to have you know, some feedback before I um, officially submit something. So that was one of the useful things that we did. Um, perhaps the more, um, uh, I guess, interesting one is the, the learning portfolio. Um, and that was something that really focused, again, on the process that we was talking about. Um, although generative AI tools can mimic the process if the student wants to spend the time doing that, um, it was really interesting to see what the students produced as part of their, what we call learning artifacts. Um, so for this assessment, um, Students had to collate and collect their course notes, their lecture notes, the activities that we did in class, um, the reflections that they made, uh, the peer reviewed feedback they got from one another, uh, the, the thoughts of the feedback that we gave them. Um, it was a bit messy, to be honest, in terms of what they submitted, but it was really insightful as to what they were getting out of the tutorials and the lectures. There were insights I never really had access to. Um, often we might get glimpses in my experience surveys, but actually seeing what a student thought of a lecture that myself or Will gave or a tutorial that Will or myself gave was really interesting to see like where we missed the mark or what was confusing to them or what they enjoyed. Um, and I'll show you some examples from the learning portfolios because um, they were quite fun as well. Um, I told students not to worry too much about this assessment in the terms of, I guess, like thinking of it as a big thing they need to do at the end of the term where they write a bunch of material. It was more just the rough, messy, like things that you've done throughout the term put together in a document that we then kind of assess. Um, there were some challenges with marking that, but it kind of, it, it, was, it was a replacement of the class participation model, which I always struggle with. Um, I don't know how I, you know, assessed class participation when I was told to um, before convening, but now my way of assessing class participation is through this model. Um, I, I think it's a bit odd to assess people based on, you know, just them being there. Uh, I think it's important to kind of participate and, and engage and students don't like always putting their hand up in class and talking, which is often how participation is assessed. So the, the portfolio gave students the opportunity to um, show their devote um, nature to the course in other ways, other than just showing up and saying hi and things like that. Um, so the learning portfolio, it's a process oriented design to demonstrate progress over a course. And that was something that I found personally interesting and, and, and so did Will, just seeing the students process, which is really helpful in terms of what we thought they were learning compared to what they were actually learning. Um, some of the learning artifacts I mentioned, class notes, self-reflections, blog posts, drafts of the essays, um, they were really important in terms of um, documenting the process. So if a student ever was to be flagged for AI, which is very problematic, and we might talk about that in Q&A, um, then at least they had something to show that in terms of the drafts, and, and that's been a big thing in the advent of these technologies, being able to demonstrate your process. Um, mind maps, drawings, learning logs, all sorts of things. Um, we had a few interesting ones as well. Um, I'll show you some, um, some snapshots from some of the portfolios, but what we found overall was that there was this, the, the sense of inclusivity and transparency, transparency, Will and I being very upfront that like, 
hey, we're in this together. We don't really know what AI is going to do to education. Let's learn about it. Um, really created an investment for the students in the course. Um, and we were excited and interested about it. It made them excited and interested about it. And we were also honest with the fact that we didn't have all the answers. So we were kind of on a shared ground. Um, and the assessment items, I guess, engaged students through that transparency and this idea of product um, uh, process over product interestingly led to authentic reflections. So in the past where I've tried to do reflective assignments, students often say things like, you know, I love the course is amazing. I learned so much. Um, here's, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a, um, a waffle in a way I've often found with reflective, not always, but sometimes students might fudge the reflection in order to gain marks. Um, the learning portfolio seemed to have some genuine reflections. Um, so this was one from a, a, a WhatsApp. Um, when we did a role play exercise in class, um, which is Will's awesome idea. Um, so we, the, the student said, so entering Gen Y was never in my course progression plan. This is them explaining the, the WhatsApp they sent to their friend. Um, obviously terrified. I don't know if they're terrified, but just extremely um, surprised that they're doing role play stuff in class. Um, and she said, during my first class, the teacher told us to role play as space explorers on a spaceship. Um, it was intriguing. At first, I did not know what to think of it as it was quite a random exercise. I texted my friend immediately after the tutorial because I found it memorable. Um, so that was a little insights you wouldn't usually get, right? A learning portfolio. Um, another student um, just wrote, I had too much fun and didn't note anything. This is their week one introduction lecture notes, which to us was a win. <laughs> I the thought student who, the student who messaged the other student didn't say that then she got so engaged that she couldn't help but like, that's right yeah like, yeah yeah just to, they were yeah. About to do that. yeah yeah um another student um really enjoyed our first activity where we shared a story about ourselves um that sounds like it's true uh not true but is it was amazing to find that from such a diverse group we could relate to similar experiences and learn about different cultures and upbringings of our class I felt more confident and prepared for speaking to our class and this activity worked to break the ice for group presentation practice, which followed. Um, so that was a fun, like I would have never have known students got that out of the tutorial. Um, this one I really love. Um, I was a very quiet person before this course. This is in the learning portfolios, by the way. Um, I couldn't open my mouth in an environment with lots of strangers. However, when I entered the study of this course, my tutor might think that he was asking a question, but it was in fact an opportunity for me to speak in front of strangers. Because there were such opportunities in almost every class, we often engage students in student center learning, so they, they participate. Um, I gradually became confident, and in the final speech, I won myself over. I did not have to read the script, but made a presentation in front of strangers. So um, I, that, that was probably my, one of my favorite comments from the whole course. But um, yeah, we will talk more about this beyond co-design and what that meant. Um, but yeah, some useful findings there. Yeah, actually, yeah. How, how we're doing for time. Yeah, how are we for time? We're just rambling, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so so we thought about like, um, you know, there's this whole kind of co-design thing um, that that is still ultimately kind of leaning on the expertise of the lecturer, right? It's like a huge, you know, sort of multiple choice. It's like choose your own adventure teaching sometimes, I think. Um, and we wanted to like, be clear with them that that we were learning as much from from the whole process as 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 you know they were hopefully probably more in a lot of the, in a lot of cases and we were we we understood this is a kind of shared problem it is a real problem like the the reality of you know a, if if AI can replace like what we do it also means that their degrees become worthless right um, and there was a there's a whole politics behind that so um, yeah we 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 were transparent about what we were doing we would kind of get up and and you know show them how we would read academically like we'd have I'd have a I print out a piece of paper and I show what you know I'd annotate it and whatever um, and make mistakes and it was kind of intimidating to do that in front of students like to be like oh wait no I didn't understand that sentence I have to go back and read that three times and then maybe I'll get it right um so yeah so we, so we, we wanted to think about it in that in that way is that it's not a kind of co-design co it's this sort of shared investment um and a shared problem um and one thing that came out of this was that we we made this um we we came to them and we said look the university's guidelines on ai use are that there are these four levels of assistance right and usually we pick them we want you to pick them um collectively like we got them to vote and one of them voted no assistance at all. So they were like, not even Grammarly. You can't even use Microsoft Word's spell check. Um, 
And but most, I think, pretty much all of them, all the rest of them, voted for three, right? Uh, which is about what we would have suggested. And the and the guidelines that they came up with were often the same kind of things that we would have suggested for assessments, right? Like they were, it was very similar. Um, they were reasonable. You know, there was nothing. We gave them the option. We said we would. I don't know what we would have done if they had have said that they can do everything. But but the the design of the assessments themselves were such that you couldn't really. Um, and so and we also kind of wanted to make the case for our assessments. We were like, look, these will help. These are teaching you. Like that's why you're here, right? Um, so then we, we, there was kind of a declaration where they, where they, you know, would just sign it. Like that was something that they included. And this was the best part was that you write a brief, brief statement below describing how you use it as a part of your assignment. And that gave us such insight on how they actually used it and allowed us to kind of work with them on ways that it could be maybe used better or they could adjust it, you know, because sometimes what would happen is that they would source an essay plan from using Gen AI, and then they wouldn't actually understand the the the, pro, the logical processes of the essay, and so then it was very apparent because each of the the points would make sense because they wasn't theirs, but then the actual flow of the logic wasn't there. Um, yeah, so um, these were the two kind of main takeaways, I guess, is that um, it can be about establishing a shared ground, even if it's just creating a shared enemy, which is what I tried to do. Um, um, but but, it, but it's something that we, you know, we're all invested in this institution in, to a greater or lesser extent, right? Um, and the other was that, um, you know, just being honest and transparent with students about how difficult it sometimes it is for us. And, you know, like me, like I self-disclose disclose that I have ADHD very early on um, and was just like, look, this is what you're going to get. Sometimes I might like, you know, do, um, yeah. So that kind of thing, like it, it sort of, it took my innate oversharing tendency and made it kind of a strength, I hope, <laughs> um, because then it was something that they could use. Um, so was there anything else that you wanted to get at? Yeah, I think we've covered everything. So yeah, that was, that was it. That was it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the idea that we don't have to be policemen with the AI and that it's something you're doing together with the students. Okay, moving on, we're going, I'm going to ask Aves Parsimi. Ah, Aves Parsimi, though, <laughs> to talk to us about inclusive Moodle design. I haven't used those before. Um, hi everyone, I'm Aves. Uh, I am an educational developer and uh, faculty LGBTQIA plus uh, co-champion uh, for my faculty. And today I'm going to talk about inclusive Moodle design. So I'm not gonna share a case study or uh, an example uh, for, for this presentation. I wanna share good practices. So you can think about this more as a, in a way, it's, well, it's based on a checklist that we uh, in the faculty uh, at Dev team, we use to review and improve some Moodle sites that we work on. Um, it's not the full list. The full list has, I think, it, we use an Excel spreadsheet that has 90 different lines. So it's, it's, it's a shortened version. Um, and because I'm a learning designer, I like to start with learning outcomes. So uh, after this presentation, I hope that you'll be able to apply some of these principles to your own Moodle sites and hopefully also to create more welcoming Moodle environments. Um, I just want to flag also, I have slides and I've got text and visuals in my slides. Um, a lot of the visuals are screenshots from Moodle. I wanted to show the Moodle environment and where things are positioned, uh, but just flagging that sometimes the text will look very small. That's okay if you can't read it, it's not, it's not essential. So I'll just, I'll jump, jump straight into the first good practice that I want to talk about, which is thinking of the overall course site structure. Uh, I think, I hope by now everyone is familiar with the new theme, Moodle Enhance, uh, and we've all done some training on this. Um, something to know about Moodle Enhance is the theme itself was designed with accessibility in mind and to improve the accessibility of all our Moodle sites. And it has received very positive feedback from students and particularly neurodivergent students. Uh, they find it easier to navigate, there's less cognitive load, so already that's good news. That said, we do recommend that um, academics or course conveners don't um, change things up too much and that to follow the recommended structure. Uh, and so the reason for this is because we're aiming for predictability and consistency, and that's really beneficial for all our students, but particularly our neurodivergent students. 
So again, we've done little enhanced training, so I won't go into the detail of the, the template, but it's a really good idea to have only a few quick links at the top, uh, avoid adding too many of those quick links because that will defeat the point of having quick links. Um, and then if you can have a course information hub as the first section and then have your assessment information in the second section, that's ideal. So avoid sort of spreading all this information all across your, um, your Moodle site and then have your weekly sections uh, below this. So I'll just move on because I've got other, a lot of other recommendations um, for the convener block or the teaching staff block. Uh, you can actually use that space to, I guess, communicate your commitment to inclusion. Uh, and one of the things you can do is to share your pronouns if that's something you're comfortable doing. I do want to emphasize this because I think regardless of your gender identity, it's something that um, is good practice. It's beneficial for your gender diverse students because it will really normalize the practice. So it's it's a very easy thing to do. You can add it next to your name if you're comfortable doing it. Um, and if you've done your ally training, which I really encourage you to, to do if you haven't, it's great training, um, you should have an, a digital badge. And that's actually something you can do is adding the badge next to your name as well. So your students already, um, particularly your LGBTIQA plus students, will know that they're safe with you. Uh, as a member of the community, I can tell you that it makes a huge difference to see those little um, markers of, of safety and inclusion. Another um, recommendation is to have an, a statement of inclusion in your Moodle site. So I know that last year, the last uh, showcase, uh, our colleague, Dr. Scott Brown, talked about having a statement of inclusion in slides, which is a good idea as well. Uh, if you're interested in having that in Moodle, a really good place is a block. So just adding an extra block, writing your statement of inclusion and, and um, sharing it there. There's a lot to talk about about statement of inclusion and we have some um, resources and, and instructions and templates. So we can continue the, the conversation about this if you're interested. Uh, but I'll move on to uh, one of my favorite sections in Moodle, the assessment section. So a couple of things I want to emphasize when you're you know, designing your site, if you can uh, have all your assessment materials in the one section, that would be ideal. And I, you know, looking at hundreds of different Moodle sites, I can see a lot of the time um, course conveners like to have the assessment information in different sections it's going to be more predictable and consistent for your students if everything is in that one section. And the other advice is to use assessment briefs. And so I don't know how common that is. I haven't seen it very often, but this is a, a way to summarize all the key assessment information. So in the faculty, for example, we use um, a template and we, we ask our academics to use the same template for each individual assessment. And so that template has, uh, and I mean, you can create your own, but the important information obviously is, you know, instructions, submission requirements, marking rubrics, use of acceptable use of AI, you can add in a brief. Uh, but the idea is that you have the same template for each individual task. Also, ideally you would put this as a file, not as a Moodle page because the files in Moodle, so Word or PDF files are more accessible for students who use different formats. Just moving down that, thinking about the weekly sections, something that is also sometimes I think overlooked is the clarity of your, of your sections. Um, I think, and we had this conversation earlier uh, with Deb, is I think sometimes we assume that the organization makes sense because it makes sense to us, but it's, you know, having looked at different Moodle sites, it's not always obvious. So something you can do to clarify the structure is just use headings. And so you can use Moodle labels, to have very clear headings and use the same headings week to week. This is going to be uh, much easier to read uh, and it's going to, again, reduce the cognitive load for your students. Um, it doesn't really matter what the structure is. I personally love the chronological, you know, before class, lecture, after class kind of structure. I used it a lot with first year students because I feel like, I don't know, I like to guide them, you know, through the week and what they have to do. But I've seen great structures that were different. So, you know, readings and activities, for example. As long as it's consistent, your student will benefit from that. Another thing, and I'm not sure, again, I haven't seen that done very often, but um, there is an option in Moodle to display instructions. 
So again, this is something that we take for granted that students will know what to do when you add a book or you add a quiz or you add a form. But it's always good practice to include very clear instructions. So just as an example, if you're having a Moodle book, you could write something like, please read this book before the first lecture, or please complete this practice quiz before the tutorial. Uh, it's not marked. So just clarifying what they're meant to do will actually make a difference for them. Uh, it's useful also to have clear instructions for students who have um, limited short-term memory and those who use screen readers. Now in Moodle, you can type the activity description and then you have an option to display it. So sometimes I don't do it because I'm conscious of the real estate and it's you have to scroll a little bit more, but it's definitely worth doing it for those activities that um, where you want to provide instructions. <coughs> files. So I've recently sort of discovered all the uh, features that are really useful in files. So um, whether you are uploading you know, Word documents, PDFs, PowerPoints, files actually have some Moodle files have good accessibility features. The first one I wanted to mention is the accessibility checker. And so when you're uploading a file, you can actually see there's a barometer icon, which will be, if you can see the color will be red, orange, or green. And it will, if you hover, you will see a score of the accessibility score of your file. And then when you click on it, it will actually open a window and you will see a list of potential issues. Um, now, most of the time when I put files, they're orange or red, so don't, that gets quite common. Unfortunately, you can't fix those issues from within Moodle. You will have to delete it, fix the issues, and then re-upload it, and then you can check again. And I'm really proud of the one that's perfect, but that's only one slide, so I cheated. I made it very easy. Um, so use the accessibility checker, and also be aware that files can be downloaded in a range of different formats, so alternative formats are available to your students whether you, uh, so if it's a Word document, a PDF or uh, slides, students actually are able to, or staff, but you know, anyone is able to download your files in a range of alternative formats that includes audio. So you can, you know, they could actually listen to your slides. Um, there is Braille, there is uh, EPUB, I think there's HTML. So there's a good range there. So it's good for you to know and let your students know as well. And this is why I always recommend using files when you can, as opposed to Moodle pages. Hyperlinks, uh, one of my favorite topics. Uh, I think I see a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of issues around how we write hyperlinks and testing that with screen readers. Uh, it's, it can be a challenge for students who use screen readers when you have hyperlinks. And it's quite common these days to actually hyperlink things in, in Moodle. Um, a couple of things, that are really important. You want your hyperlinks to be concise. So avoid you know, hyperlinking whole paragraphs or sentences. That's not gonna be very accessible for screen readers. And more importantly, make it very meaningful and descriptive. So we see a lot of click here. So for a screen reader, that's gonna be confusing or for, for a student using a screen reader, it will be confusing because the screen reader will say, link, click here. So the screen reader or the use the student will not know where the link is going. So better to a, a better way to do it is to you don't have to write link, but you could say you could just hyperlink, you know, gradebook for example. And so the screen reader will say link gradebook. Um, so yeah, avoid those click click here or find out more here or all those vague terms. You can test this with a uh, uh, Microsoft narrator, by the way. So it's pretty good at, at sort of reading your, your Moodle pages. Now, by default, Moodle will open links in the same tab, which is great. Um, don't make your links open in a different tab because that's actually um, can be disorienting. So it's better to actually stay in the same tab. If you have to open the link in a, set, a new tab, then you can just give advanced warning. So then the, the student will know that the link will actually create a new tab. I think this one is a little bit more commonly known. If you're using images, make sure that you are including alternative texts. Um, if your image is conveying meaning or is important for the understanding, if it's just decorative, obviously you can mark it as decorative. Um, and then if you are if you are including alternative texts, it's the same kind of principle as for hyperlinks, uh, just make it concise and meaningful and descriptive. So the screen reader will actually um, 
communicate the information in a very clear way. Videos, uh, if you are including video materials in Moodle, it's always better to aim for a short video. Uh, so I definitely would not go over 20 minutes in terms of attention. That's gonna lose a lot. A lot of your students are gonna be distracted. Um, I think, I believe, and from what I've been reading, the sweet spot would be six to 10 minutes for engagement. And that's actually not only for neurodivergent students, but also for, for all your students really. Um, now I'm aware that Echo 360 doesn't allow for this. So I'm not necessarily talking about your lecture recordings, which you can't really, split up but for anything else that if you're recording your own videos for example and of course if you are uh, adding video materials enable captions and transcripts this is useful for so many different students um, it's useful for uh, students with hearing disabilities uh, it's but it's also really valuable for your students who may be still learning english or multi multilingual students uh, and they really value having the the text in, in writing i do use uh, Microsoft Stream for this. It's great for transcripts and captions. You only have a toggle and you just enable the transcripts. And what I love about Stream is that you can edit the transcripts, which as someone who speaks with an accent, I really, I just can, I do not like reading the transcripts that are auto-generated because the French accent is creating very strange words, but this I can go in, edit it, save it, and then it's reflected straight into the Moodle site. There are little there are limitations with stream with permissions, so that's something to be aware of. It's not perfect, but it's probably one of the best platforms. And my final uh, recommendation is to be aware that you have an accessibility checker in the Atto editor. So whenever you are using the editor, you can quickly check with that um, that icon. It's a little bit hidden, and it took me a while to actually find it, but uh, it looks like a, a person standing in a you know on a black circle. And this will actually automatically check your um, your images or so missing alternative uh, texts for your your tables, your chunks of text as well if they're too long. Uh, I think there's other color, color contrast as well. So it's a good quick tip, something you can do whenever you're you're using the editor. And that was my final uh, recommendation. I have more, and I'm really happy to continue this conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Aves. I think you're helping me get over my Moodle distrust I don't know fumbling <laughs> um we have time for questions did anything come through online is he not yet questions from anyone in the room for any of the speakers today I have one if it's okay yeah um James and Will, are you able to talk a bit more about, um, you mentioned sort of the problematic nature of screening for AI use in assessments. Are you able to talk a bit more about that? And we'll get everyone to just come up to the mic as well so people yep. are mic in. I mean, there's the two, sorry, there's two sides to it. One is like the technical side, mm -hmm. which I guess you can speak to, like in terms of the, just that the turning doesn't, it's not an automatic Thing. Right, right, right. Okay, so yeah, so problem with turning in. Um, <laughs> it it is in some ways a useful resource because there is a kind of uh, a stoppage there that students might consider before just plugging something away in ChatGPT and submitting it. There is a a chance that it could flag it, and therefore they might not want to run that risk. the The problem, however, is that the ability to detect AI is sort of very um, questionable. So OpenAI had their own uh, tool for detecting AI. These are the people that run ChatGPT, which they sort of quietly removed from their website. So that detector no longer exists. Um, and they've actually come out and said publicly, um, or on their website rather, their public facing website, that in the short answer to do AI detectors work, the answer is no. Um, and it, it is actually discriminatory towards people that have English as an additional language, um, particularly if they're using tools that they might be using like Grammarly, um, because the, the language that those tools tend to um, suggest is like more normative, more, um, I guess, like sounds like what the typical most predictive response would be. 
um, which creates all sorts of problems for like things that we encourage is like student voice and having, you know, a voice in your writing. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of limitations to those AI detection tools, um, although the uni does use it to, you know, detect students' work. So I would say on the use of Turnitin, um, if you're a teacher or coordinator, um, it's not the sort of final nail in the coffin. If you do detect AI in a student's work, it's obviously just the start of the conversation. And we have a conversation starters resource, which is on the SharePoint thingy, which is for generative AI. Um, so if you yeah, are interested in checking that out, have a look. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not the final say. Um, any detection that it, it does flag is probably going to be questionable. <laughs> I had a student once who didn't take out the chat yes. part of the chat GPT. Yeah, we've had that a few Like times. sometimes it's really easy to like figure yeah. out that's what's going on. Or, or sometimes they'll copy and paste it directly and it that's will, what it is. Yeah, it puts the it'll, background it's in. the background thing. Yeah, the grayed out background. So yeah. Um and then it just it, it just kind of like it, 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 it's it's not that it then becomes impossible for them to do it. It's just that the students right. who are really not great at it because they're rushing or they don't have that technical aptitude. So, you know, use a, they, they, there are all these programs that will just change, take GPT text and then change the way that it's worded to make sure that it doesn't get flagged by turning. Yeah. So it's like, I think the problem there is at a design level rather than at a, like a detection level. Like the emphasis on detection is kind of like, this is the point. Quick question, how many students did you have? Yeah, just how many, how many, how many students, students did you have? Because, I mean, I like a lot of the ideas, but I'm thinking, how do you do that if you have, you know, a lot of students? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did want to preface that. Um, we're really lucky in our program because there's only usually between 30 and 50 students in our course. Um, so it is a smaller program and it's a gen ed subject. So it's students from different faculties and backgrounds. Um, in a bigger course, a learning portfolio might be a bit of a challenge to mark if you've got, say, 300 or more students. Um, even 50 is tough. Like, even marking 30 learning portfolios was tough. Like, so there are challenges with the marking of that assessment, I'll agree. Um, but, yeah, we do we'll luckily have a smaller class and classes. And we also yeah. made up for, we, made, we, we sort of were able to make up for kind of like that in terms of having activities in class that were built into it. So we were sort of, the marking wasn't so concentrated in the learning portfolio in that like the what they were talking about we already knew we didn't have to kind of reorientate in the way that you would with a lecture or with sorry with an essay or whatever so yeah my question was going uh, thank you for your presentation by the way thank you for everybody's presentation today it was a great session um my question was you did flag um some challenges around marking and and thinking about <clears throat> you know, the potential, I love the assessment change and the focus on process. I think that overcomes so many of the challenges um, that we may be facing in this space, but also thinking about <clears throat> the nature of highly casualized courses where we're asking um, tutors who aren't necessarily in all teaching space, learning and teaching spaces to do that. And maybe the, the your familiarity with content in yeah. classes helps you but in you know in in classes or courses where that's not the case, mm. can you speak through um, you know what what some of the challenges are and what might be some potential solutions based on that or how you think it might go? One of the things we started doing a lot more was getting feedback with was giving feedback and arranging uh, situations where students were giving each other feedback within the class itself, mm -hmm. because we already know that student, not not all students even read the feedback that we give on turning in. I mean, um, and in terms of the casualized thing, like definitely, like I remember marking, you know, as a postgrad, like two hundred essays in a week or whatever, and having to kind of manage that. I think that, like, I found I didn't find the portfolio that hard to mark mm -hmm. in that, like. And this is again like there's a limited time in everybody's life, so so this is um, obviously there's a caveat on that. But like I was in, so interested that and it kept me interested that I normally someone who very who struggles with time and and motivation and everything, I just found that I I had no problem marking to deadlines. And in fact, we had really yeah. short turnarounds, like in terms of the because of the way that we designed it, mm. knowing that you know with with all this in mind. Um, and so then it, it really made it that possible because we were motivated, but that's- I think, like, yeah, yeah, in terms of the marking, you're not sort of reading every single word and, yeah. and spell checking and marking and, and giving suggestions. It is a very raw kind of artifact of, of their process. So um, you're essentially just kind of scanning over it, noticing like you're, you're, you're wanting to see that they have participated in the course and that they've demonstrated that participation in some way. And that will very quickly reveal itself. Um, we had a couple of students that just submitted like links to their blog posts and that was it. So, you know, we had to like click on the links and then read the blog posts, which ironically were generative AI written. Um, so there were problems there. Um, 
You could quickly tell, by the way, a blog post when it's generally they are. Immediately made it clear, like you wouldn't even have to market. No, know that, that it was just yeah. that shouldn't just happen, which was kind of shocking. I think that mm. was one of the that was one of the most problematic things that we found was that in this course where we'd emphasized and talked about the nature of AI and how it's used and the whole thing was about that, and this, and you still had a student who was flagged for AI in the first yeah the first essay and then submitted an AI written again, essay yeah. again. After giving um, and that was kind of shocking. I mean, it's in line with research, I think that says that a certain yeah. percent of students will like, 8%, yeah, yeah will we'll kind of do that. Mm -hmm. They'll just roll the dice. Sorry? Yeah, we'll keep doing it. And so, but I mean, one of one of the students in the course, they 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 said that AI was really, is, is that this is going to be a natural process. This was their argument in their, in their eventual report was that they think that that, that pressure to standardize is so great that students are just going to follow that regardless and that that's going to be the end result of all of this so there were some very pessimistic visions of the future of the university the question that we asked them was you know uh for the, for the assessment for the first assessment for the essay slash report was like you know what what are the implications for the future of the university from generative ai and then they then as a group they presented on what do we do about that what does how does the university respond how should the university respond mm -hmm. how can we respond how should you respond and so on um and so some of them were like smash all the machines um and others were like legislation as a response so it was it was, it was varied yeah so yeah i don't know if that answered the question but yeah like i think it, i think it would there are principles that you can take that would still work mm. regardless of what course it is i mean you know the, the requirements of prim are going to be different to the requirements of this mm. the benefit of it being academic skills is that it's really general we're not teaching we're not teaching a particular kind of set of content we're teaching skills mm. and, like I think that, yeah, there's a flexibility there. So yeah. Um uh, thanks again for the um awesome insights there, which are really useful. Um I don't know if it's a specific question, which always is terrible when you start like that, but I promise it's good. Um I, I'm wondering about like a thread that I'm hearing through all of the presentations is like attempting to move away from the kind of punitiveness of mm. the way, you know, education is done, whether that's, you know, being punitive to students who use AI or, or, or whatnot, whether it's timelines or is it punishing students for, you know, having different learning needs uh, and the more explicit stuff in, in our presentation. And I'm wondering uh, what others, uh, whether others have reflections on, the barriers to kind of trying to not be punitive in these spaces, because it, it there is actually a politics of that in universities that I think we need to talk about, right? That that there is that that's the default, mm -hmm. um, and if you move away from that, like you know, you come up against um, barriers. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, what are our barriers and what do we do about them? Well, I, sit I actually think part of the way to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is to have them maybe not always have to write to show what they've done. I think students that keep doing that, it's because they don't write well, but there might be a myriad of other ways they could express themselves. Granted, it makes for more work for marking and things, but I try to view DL assessments. It also makes for more work getting it through committees. I'm not gonna lie about that. We have a very inflexible kind of way of thinking. So if I say, you know, my students either gonna write an essay or do interpretive dance to show me what they've done, I'm going to have a hard time getting that through the education committee. But sometimes you can give them choices where maybe they don't, I really think, Nobody wants to cheat. I think they resort to those things out of panic and anxiety and, you know, not the way I expressed how I've met your learning objectives. What I would say also is that I think it has to do with explaining students why certain rules are in place and that they have to make sense. So it's about saying, look, it's about equity. If I just give you three days, but don't give someone else three days, it will be, why didn't I get three days? And so it's about sometimes, but I do understand that it's hard because we still use the, the language of penalties, right? Of late penalties, you're late, you know, mister, and just kind of like wagging, you know, the, the, the finger. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, the like communication, you know, the thing with AI, I kind of mentioned briefly, um, what I did this term then was make the, the videos and I, my course is globalization and governance. So it's really open and kind of abstract. And I asked them to do two videos where they get 
everyday objects. And one video was look at the, the global governance of that object. And the other one was how globalization is reflected in that object. And their trouble was the opposite because they're like, I've never done a video. You know, mo most of us have never done, but I'm like, this is great because this is a very low stakes experience. <laughs> like, I'm not judging you on, the only thing that I asked was that it be educational. So I said no hostage videos. I made it like the first thing. <laughs> so I don't want someone just doing, you know, like, yes, but it has to be educational. But I think also just to letting students know why you're doing the thing and to say, I'm not going to judge you on your editing skills. I'm not looking at, you know, your shots and whatever. It's really about the content, but also saying in that case, you can show your face, you cannot show your face, you can, you know, kind of giving the guy, but I think going back to your, your answer would be, if you do have some sort of what we would consider punishment, I think it's more about having to instead of reframing and saying it's not a punishment, but it's an issue of equity. Um, but also trying to say, if you do have issues with this, like come talk to me. And then if students come talk to you, you're not an asshole, because that's also the other problem, right? We can't control, but. Yep, so we've got a question from one of our panelists, Andy, who has put their camera on. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Of course, when Kev started talking, he, he uh, stole my question. So I'm just going to kind of build on the <laughs> conversation that, that's been had here. And, you know, I think kind of coming back to the um, the point Kev was making about you know the use of um carceral language you know in the way that we've described you know how these technologies or systems are working within the university so we've used like we don't want to be the AI police we don't want to have punishment systems or punitive systems and just kind of from like from the kind of crim perspective you know this is part of what we would call carceral cultures um and you know, thinking about how we can push back on this from an equity space in a number of different areas. And I was really interested, Deb, to um, hear your reflections on the um, flexi date. Funnily enough, I've actually been doing that in my courses as well since about 2020. And some of the other folks in um, CRIM have done, and we talked about it a little bit in a, in a previous presentation, a longer presentation on the system impacted students. And um, I was just kind of interested on your, you know, in, if you, if you wanted to share reflections from others about um, doing this in your courses, I've had mostly positive responses from people, but a little bit of pushback from like on the kind of, you know, so what equity um, issues, but also from the, um, you know, the fact that like you were talking about, people think that every single student is going to do that. And, you know, I've done it in a really large um, first year courses and had just about the same results as you. So only about half the students or less have taken it up um, each time it was um, available. So, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in your perspectives on like on other people's um, impressions of that work. <laughs> um, I'll go here because it's easier. No, thanks, Andy. And um, I, I think that what happens is that most conveners don't know and so I think it comes from a place of ignorance in the purest form of the word, like they just don't know what's going to happen. So it's always concerning. You don't know, um, you know, there's a concern that if you're not following university policies. So that's also one thing. The way that I did it, and that's why I changed the language from saying it was an extension, because an extension is something that only admin can do. But the moment I say it's about a flexibility and deadlines, I have control over the deadlines in my course. So that's also a way that I found to kind of circumvent that, that issue, right? And just say, no, it's about, I'm already saying from the get-go and it's equitable in the sense that it's available for everyone. So that's why for me, it was important to not be asking questions because I didn't want to have the sense that only if you gave me a reason that I found a valid is that you would have it. So in order to not have issue with disclosure and to say, I don't care, you wanted to stay home and watch TV late, that's you know your prerogative. But I wanted that, that's kind of how the equity worked in my way. Can I just jump in? Like, I think these forums and the sharing of these stories, you know, like I think the biggest, you know, the biggest barriers in terms of wider uptake of this is the precarious nature of the way so many people are employed in this sector. 
um, yep. and the pressure on them to conform to the various rules that we know in many cases are problematic, but the confidence and, and kind of, um, you know, your position is, you know, is in flux, right? So if you, if you aren't confident, you are far less, less likely to resist. And so seeing, you know, um, more senior, um, you know, staff doing this, having success, not, you know, um, necessarily always having issues in doing it is, is really powerful. And I think it's important that we're sharing these stories because it normalizes practices that we know are better and, and more inclusive. But it's a really, it's a really big thing for someone who is, you know, taking on their first course even though they may know this is, you know, what needs to happen to then do it because we know um, the pressures that come when you have to stand behind your marks or there's a special consideration that's still outstanding and the pressure to finalise these courses and sit in faculty committees and, and all those things. But, I mean, that is that is powerful thing. So. And, and, also, and, and also, I think there's an issue of a concern that if it doesn't work, it's going to reflect poorly on your my experience. <laughs> and so for some people, I think depending where you are, you know, you're you're seeking, you know, you're going for a promotion, um, unless you're very secure that you can say, no, I tried it, it didn't work, but it was something that I tried, this was the reasoning, this is why students didn't do it, and this is why I'm going to do different. But unless you know how you can, I won't say spin, but how you can explain these things, it's also... You know, it's it's easier to to follow the status quo because there's a lot less barriers. And I think for some people, it's like, oh, life is already so hard. Everything is so hard. Moodle is already so hard. I'll just control C, control V, everything that I can because I just can't. Yeah. Can I just add a point in there, Phil, just on the, and Deb, on the casualized work? I think another, you know, challenge with the flexi period is, you know, the so-called 10-day turnaround that we have on turning those marks back to students and when you've got big courses 250 plus students have to challenge anyway um what I did with this was um I told the students that if you hand it in on time or on, on the original due date and don't take up the flexi period you're guaranteed to have your paper back within the 10 days but if you take if you take that flexi period and absolutely everyone was able to take it if they needed it you may not have it back within that 10 day period and this is especially because there was a large number of casualized um staff working in the course and you know they need to kind of like it's it's too much to ask um you know, those staff to only be, you know, start marking um, within a shorter period than that 10 days as well. So it's and kind of, again, I, what I, Phil was saying, like, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry, no, Kat, just, sorry, sorry Andy, but just adding to that, I did the same. I told students yep. if it's, but then it's easier when you say you chose this new deadline, this new deadline yep. means that you're going to have, you know, things that are going to be due only two days later you know, or yeah. one day later, because it's marked in the sequence that it's received. Yeah. But I think yeah. if you already tell students like all of this in advance, it just makes things a lot smoother. Yeah, I think the key is to like, it's treating students like they're adults, adults with complex lives, like we are, you know, and they stuff happens and they're able to, and I think they really appreciate that autonomy. Anybody else? Other questions? And I will just say also really quickly, I'm a big fan of begging forgiveness instead of asking permission. Yeah, I have a question for the first presenter. So do you know how many students that has been impacted by the system or like going through the legal system? Do you have any like data on that? Happy that, yeah, well, and this is what our project is now starting to do because the university doesn't collect uh, any of this information. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a critical gap that we are trying to look into. Um, and, and obviously we need to know what, how, how widespread, you know, we, we, can, we can have, you know, the project that we're undertaking now is, is obviously looking at it from a program perspective and, and within our faculty, but we know that this is, you know, this is something that's university wide, and so it needs to, we need support um, higher up. And that's why the, the plan is to, from our pilot project, expand to a, a larger EDI central project uh, next year, which may help facilitate some of that. And I think um, sort of the question of how many is, is that, I think it is 
an important one, but it isn't the direct focus of th this project that we're doing right. Um, but the the idea of system impacted is that you know there will be large numbers of people who are system impacted under that definition, whether that's you know directly impacted through you know being criminalized, being incarcerated, and we come up against lots of those students who intersect with all of those things that we were talking about, you know, colonized students, uh, people living with disability, those are things that can organically come up in a classroom or, or what, whatever, and that, that need to be dealt with. But there are also like lots of spaces in the university that talk about uh, people who are incarcerated and who don't engage with this stuff, right? You know, um, there will be spaces in education, in psychology, in public health, like, like lots of different parts of the social science, like lots of different parts of the university. Um, and I think part of the idea of the project is, you know, a proof of concept, right, in, in our faculty and then, you know, everywhere else. Well, and I don't think numbers should be the focus because if you're using language that's impacting one person, that's way one person too many, regardless of what we're talking about. But I really think it's an awareness issue because I don't know, I always try to use respectful language for everybody, but I don't know that I've ever given that specific thought. And I'm sure there's many people that have it. So great that you guys were able to come here and talk about that today. I'm appreciative of that. And it's made me think twice and I'm sitting here going, hmm. <laughs> but yeah, right. Well, as we've done with each marginalized group that comes through that says, hey, what about us? And you're doing this and we all go, <gasps> So it's we're always trying to learn new ways of using language to bring people into the group rather than exclude them and keep them on the margins. Um, if no one else in the room has one, um, I've got another one. Um, and I think being a, a student and a staff member at UNSW for so long um, and, and hearing, I think, a lot of the ways that students have spoken about as almost kind of something to be defeated um, and people that are always trying to to game the system. Um, I guess how do you all stay motivated to keep going and to keep, you know, why is this important to you? Uh, I, I was just going to say that, you know, um, uh, that um, the basic point is that for, for me and, you know, probably everyone else in this room that, you um, teaching is impact, right? So, you know, what you do in the classroom is absolutely how you affect change in the world and all of those sorts of things. And if that's part of your remit as a person in the world, as an academic, um, then, then they, yeah, that's how you stay motivated for me. Yeah. I think the, the will and the motivation are always there. But one thing I wanted to, to talk about is the need to, for it not to be based on our individual motivation. Like, the projects that we are doing and have been doing for an extended period of time. This all takes an incredible investment of time uh, to repeat and to come up against the frustrations. And it is inherently demotivated. Like it can really get to you. And we've all been in, you know, the value of our, our colleagues and peers to debrief constantly, um, you know, to have that support and allyship is, is critical to it. That's one way of keeping your motivation in the face of the, the barriers that you're constantly coming up against, but also the need to set this up so that it is not dependent on that continue. You know, we're always going to be invested, but we need to move beyond. We need the institution to build communities of support that then put in place policy that is better so that it is not the labour of us banging up against walls constantly. I mean, we're probably going to keep doing that regardless because there's lots of walls. But, you know, like, I think one thing that that inspires is seeing that that change through the um, through it through your activism and advocacy of of it getting better. And we see it, you know, in, in talks like this, that it is becoming, a, you know, we're having conversations in mainstream environments at the university where previously we had to hide these things oh, we're breaking rules, oh, we're going to get in trouble. You know, we are having these open conversations now and, you know, maybe the recording of this will go to places, then we will get in trouble, but that's okay, right? It's okay. Like, we're, we're, we are fortunate 
that we are in stable employment. We can fight these fights and we have to keep fighting these fights. And, and that is the labor that is required, but we need this to go beyond us. Where you've learned nothing, um, you know, you are hurting yourself, first of all. And second of all, I don't think anybody does that all the time. Like I said, I think they always have reasons. It's, it's, we just keep going and we keep trying to find out what they are and how we can support them not to have to do that. I don't know. I, I read something that I loved when someone saying teachers aren't paid to teach, they're paid to mark. <laughs> That's the part that nobody really loves. But most people like, I mean, if you're not excited about teaching, like, why are you here? You know, it's, it's for me, I mean, personally, it's like, if you don't like people, you shouldn't be teaching, you know, if you if, <laughs> like there's, there's, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's also to be able to give support to students who really want to do well, um, you know, and, and sometimes even the life experience of being able to say, look, you might not, you know, remember my course five years from now, but hopefully you will remember that you had a good time being, you know, it's fine to be curious. It's fine not to know things. It's fine to have fun when you're trying, I don't know, just, just something that you can take out of that, you know, that experience that you impact the person again with the process that just goes beyond, you know, I, I'd learned the definition of whatever, but it's, you know, it's something else that students can take out. For me, one of the best is, well, two, a recent one, the student said, I really liked your classes because of your enthusiasm. You even made theory fun. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I was able to do that. And another one that was simple, it was an, another student, a, a more mature student who said, I understand the news better. And, and of course, she, she took mine as an elective and she said, I understand the news better. I understand the world better. And to me, that's like, I'm, you know, it's um, good. I have to wrap up, sorry, we're out of time. I first of all want to thank all of you that presented today, all of you that took time out of your extremely busy days to attend, the DIIU for, and Izzy especially, for doing all the organization and also the Diversity Fest people, the staff, you guys have been amazing helping this to happen every year. And it's just been great to have this kind of a forum where we can talk about these things. So in closing, just thank you everybody. <laughs>